Michael, welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Pacor. I'm Trevor Page. Thanks for joining us on this uh, second episode, although we're not really numbering them anymore. So on our last show, uh, we had started off the show with some EV FUD type information. And we had a couple of stories that we were looking at at the time. We broke it up. We wanted to follow up with the second story. And that's when you look at comparing gas stations to EV charging stations. A lot of the argument of people that are not a supportive EV saying, well, there's not enough infrastructure out there to support it. And, you know, there's gas stations all over the place. So there was a, a recent U.S. study that was done that looks at some of the numbers. In the United States, uh, under a third of a percent of all autos on the road, these are consumer automobiles, are electric vehicles. So 0.29 percent. That equates now the total number of autos on the road in the U.S. is about 270 million plus or minus. Um, and they estimate about 150,000 gas stations that provide about eight pumps per station when you average it out. So when you do the math, that gives you a ratio of about 225 autos per available pump. Um, now, in the U.S., there are approximately 794,000 electric vehicles uh, with about 48,472 or so public charging stations. Uh, again, this number does not include residential or private stations. So when you do that math, it gives you the ratio of 16 to 1. So we go from 225 to 1 to 16 to 1 in uh, EVs which is a pretty good ratio. So it's about 14 times more than gas pumps. Now, when we when we factor in residential home charging, because we know that most people charge at home, um, now that number, and we guess about 75% of EV owners have home-based charging. So when you add those numbers, that, uh, that 75% equals just around 600,000 additional charging stations. And it takes that ratio even lower to about 1.23 to 1. So it, it's a really nice argument that you can, or, or facts that you can come back with uh, to people that are countering about infrastructure. And a lot of the studies that are out there take broad approaches uh, for, for EV infrastructure and compare, comparing them with gas stations. And you have to remember that's a little misleading because the majority of EVs are still heavily, um, in the U.S., are still heavily centric by state. So yeah. states that have early adoptions, like California being the number one, with over 5% of all e auto sales being EVs. So it really is a different refueling paradigm when you talk about um, uh, electric vehicle charging stations um, versus refueling your traditional gas stations. I mean, when, when we go to gas stations, we're in and out in a couple of minutes, right? You, you fill up and you go. Charging stations, though, can, can take more time for DC fast charging as well. It can take up to 45 minutes to an hour. So it's a little bit different experience. And, and a lot of those uh, fast charging stations are co-located in areas where there's businesses, shops, Shopping, hotels, restaurants, things like that, so that uh, EVers tend to uh, use the stop as a part of the whole trip experience. Or, you know, I'm going to go have lunch, or I'm going to do something, going to do some shopping, yeah. and so forth. And you've experienced this on some of your journeys, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's either destination charging or opportunity charging. You know, it's not always. You don't always need a fast charge. And, That's right. You know, the fast charge is like when you have a case of I got to get there itis. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, if you're <laughs> like just that. shopping, you're gonna be there for a couple hours. Eh, yeah. Charge? Why not? So uh, some some good uh, information to throw back at people uh, when you're having that conversation, or if you're again you're you're on the fence thinking about electric vehicle. Here's another good reason why you can look at. One. I will tell you this. I'll just add this real quick. Um, when I get this argument, what I do is I pull up the plug share app on my phone and I just zoom in on the local area. And that ends the argument every single time. Good point. Yeah, it's a great app. <laughs> yeah. So some stories that we follow, that we continue to monitor and follow up. Now we talked about the Nissan Leaf Rapid Gate concern on our last show. We reached out to Nissan Canada, and this is the response that we got from them. And I quote: "The 2018 Nissan Leaf has charging safeguards to protect the battery during repeated fast charging sessions in a short period of time." So while the safeguards may increase charging times after multiple fast charging sessions, they are important to maintaining battery life over an extended time period. So this is definitely a feature, a built-in, um, uh, it's built into the BMS system for the LEAF that they want to protect the battery. So they do purposely throttle to keep, back. To uh, keep it from overheating. Keep it from overheating, right. exactly, because heat is, is the, the culprit in uh, battery degradation and, and damage. Mm -hmm. So it's a purposefully built um, feature to that. So, you know, your mileage will vary, but if you're looking at an EV to do, you know, five, six, seven EV fast chargers all the time, then you may want to look at something else, yeah. right? And there are, the, the good thing is there's lots of choice. Is there a potential to wait for the 60 kilowatt battery? Because the news I keep hearing for the next version of the LEAF with the larger battery pack, which is supposed to happen sometime early next year, as far as I know, 
uh, will have a liquid cooled battery pack? My understanding uh, in sources from Nissan is that, yeah, the, the larger battery pack, assuming around 60 kilowatt hour, will have an active uh, thermal management system, so then it may some sort of issue, cooling. So, and it may even be a different, uh, I doubt it'll be a different battery supplier because it's from the company that they sold off, but I certainly think that they will, uh, they will activate um, active thermal management solutions there. Um, and you know, possibly change the chemistry again in, in, in the batteries. They may still use pouch batteries. And my understanding is that the Leaf will start production in later 2019, that, that Leaf Gen 2.5, whatever you want to call it. Oh, really? Um, and be available for 2020, but it could happen sooner. Mm, so, okay. Well, we'll, well, we'll wait as we see. have more information, we'll, uh, we'll bring it yeah. to you. So there's some information on that. Another story, of course, that we reported on a couple of months ago was the Germany Tesla scandal, um, whereas the German government was fighting with Tesla that they didn't have a vehicle that qualified for their incentive program of having a vehicle priced under the 60,000 euro price point. So they took it off the incentive list. Mm. Tesla fought that over the last couple of months, and they ended up winning this fight because the German government just uh, as of March 6 put Tesla back on the eligibility list for the 4,000 euro incentive that they can qualify for. That's good buyers. news for Germany. Yeah. So good news for Germany, good news if you're thinking to buy a, a Tesla in Germany. Quickly on the March scorecard, it's a scorecard that uh, Inside EVs puts out and we tend to monitor it. Um, the top, out of the top 10 electrified vehicles in this, this is a USA number, a scorecard. Six of them were battery uh, only vehicles. So we're starting to see that shift of, you know, plug-in hybrid to, to all electric, yeah. all battery. Of course, Model 3 being number one, uh, which surpassed the 3,800 delivery I'm mark surprised in there. <laughs> March. They are trending very well. That puts the Tesla 3 for the first calendar quarter of this year at almost 8,200 deliveries. Again, the Tesla numbers are estimated by Inside EVs because it's hard to get exact numbers until the calls. But they, they their record has been really good. They're, yeah, they're, they're almost they spot on. So. Well, yeah. They're really close. Model S and X were, were the other ones up there. The Bolt uh, had uh, over uh, 1,775. The Leaf at 1,500. So it's starting to surge. And the, uh, the, the bottom of that top 10 from electrification vehicle perspective was the i3. Mm. Uh, and that includes the Rex versions as well. They don't split that up. So uh, still doing some sales. So overall for the first quarter of 2018, the calendar quarter, it seems like in the US, Tesla did about 18,000 vehicles. So Impressive. when you factor in what they're doing globally, uh, they should easily break the 100,000 uh, global sales, if not maybe 125,000 oh, at this point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's that what they've been trending for. Uh, yeah, maybe 150 even. So, uh, well, on the SNX, well, yeah, of course, when you add three into the mix, easily. Yeah. The SNX have, have been largely scaled at about 100,000. About 100,000. But yeah. the, the Model 3 is going to put them over that for so sure. That's going to be the ringer in that equation. And some noticeable notable mentions the e Golf had 164 in the US. Um, the uh, Ionic EV only had about 60. And the Kia Soul had 150. Yeah, so I'm not sure the why Eagle. they're not. It's such yeah. a nice car. Yeah. It is. Why yeah. don't they bring more in? <laughs> they just aren't building that many, yeah, Trev. Guess, yeah. Guess. What can you do? Too bad. I know, exactly. Um, sticking with Tesla Model 3. So, of course, good news that the deliveries are up. Uh, we are hearing that by this time or the end of April-ish, that production should get closer to 2,500 units per week. However, they just announced a five-day plant shutdown. Maybe you can talk about that. Uh, yeah, the media has been making too much noise about the plant shutdown. This is kind of normal, uh, you know, for any manufacturer to retool or rejig. We did get some information from the CBS article that Tesla had made some mistakes along the way with automation. So this could be part of that. Um, I'm not too worried about it because it's only three to five days. So uh, anyway, so apparently they're taking some of the automation out or rejiggering with some people and stuff. Well, uh, you know, the upcoming financial call hopefully will mm -hmm. uh, will shed some more light on what they've made some changes because they did do uh, drop some some pretty big bombshells in this thing about automation. So hopefully um, some of the analysts on this call will will grill Elon on, on what kind of changes that they've made. So looking forward to that. Um, they're still uh, looking to produce, uh, you know, five to six thousand cars sometime by you know, the third quarter, which is still encouraging. So, mm -hmm. you know, the production still ramping up. So that's that's always good for those of you waiting for VIN numbers. It, you know, it could be almost imminent and stuff. Speaking of which, um, of course, with Model 3 being available in Canada now, uh, we did get some information recently that they are, are going to start calling people now 
uh, to start issuing some potential delivery dates as soon as June. Mm -hmm. So um, if you haven't checked your account, check your VIN number and see if there's anything in there. I, again, we don't have any reports of anyone receiving VIN numbers in Canada okay. yet. It's still coming, but I've been told that it's almost imminent. Um, the other part, too, we should mention, uh, for those of you who, who don't know, who are waiting, um, in Ontario, the Model 3 has finally made the uh, EHVIP mm -hmm. incentive list now, so it does qualify for the uh, $14,000 Ontario incentive. Um, again, how long that lasts is up, up for grabs because, mm -hmm. again, uh, we have an upcoming election and they've made it pretty clear that they're against anything green or whatever. So <laughs> if you're counting on the rebate to afford the Model 3 and you're just waiting for that all-wheel drive and it might happen in July, uh, I would caution you not to wait anymore. It's actually safe to pull the trigger now, but if you're counting on the rebate, uh, don't leave the money on the table. Just do it. Yeah, it's a great car, um, all-wheel drive or not. I think you'll be very pleased with it. So I just wanted to put that out there. Oh, the other thing too we got to mention is there's still some confusion that we're getting uh, from people asking about the $75,000 cap. That's across all cars. So if the car is over $75,000, mm -hmm. it doesn't qualify. However, that cap is only on the base price of the car. Options don't count. So things like autopilot and your paint and your wheels, they don't count. And uh, our estimation of the car coming in right now at about $57,000, you're under the $75,000 cap. If you do wait, and let's say they add the all-wheel drive, and let's call it $6,000, you're still under the cap. So it fully qualifies. Still pretty safe. Yeah. So it's important to remember, options on the Model 3, Autopilot, and all those other things, they don't count against mm -hmm. the cap. So you're fully safe uh, to get the rebate on the Model 3 at this point. Mm -hmm. It's only the S and the X because they start well right. above $75,000. They're just not on the well list above. anymore. The yeah. Well, yeah, well above $75,000. <laughs> And then we heard something about Model y, Model y production that could start in November of next year. Is that an Elon number or where does that come well, from? Well, there was some information that was uh, gathered out there um, that um, Tesla had sent out some uh, tenders, I guess, to mm -hmm. contractors mm -hmm. for parts. Um, put, and, and they said that they were planning for production to start in sometime in November of 2019. But, you know, Tesla's... Uh, start record for production is not always on par and stuff. So I would take that with a huge no grain comment. Of, yeah, a huge grain of salt. But what it does is it indicates that we should see the yeah. Model Y reveal happen sometime this summer, maybe in the fall. So yeah. as soon as we know more, we'll uh, we'll let you know. Yeah. So on to some other manufacturers. Now we talked about BMW in the last show that they were actually seem to be taking a step back and a wait and see from an electrification standpoint. But just in that short couple of weeks, they've done a 180, and now they are stating, restating the importance of electrification for their business in the future. They're announced, they've announced spending plans for R&D in excess of 7 billion euros, some huge money they're throwing mm -hmm. at this. Uh, in 2017, the BMW Group sold about 104,000, just over 103,000 plug-in electric cars. That was up 65%, so there's definitely a, an upward trend for them in sales. This year, their target is 140,000. By the end of 2019, 500,000. So within a really short period of time, they're seeing this, this hockey stick as well. Um, many new models are coming to the market for them, as we talked about in previous shows, including the uh, iX3, the new i4, and the electrified Mini. Uh, and by 2025, they'll have a total of 25 cars that'll have a plug of some sort. So Yeah, I think they're feeling some pressure yeah. from Volkswagen Agreed. and Mercedes, right? They had yep. a bit of a head start on them, and then they kind of like dropped the ball a little bit. Now they're, they're back with full force. So good for BMW. I like their products, so yeah. I know you do. They, they are good <laughs> products. Let's move on to the Chevy Bolt. Uh, a couple of uh, things about the Chevy Bolt to talk about. First of all, there seems to be either either a recall or not an official recall, but there are some issues with some potential faulty cell, cells in the 2017 model year bolts only that have been found to lead to uh, an issue where there's no propulsion, where the car, car just simply loses drive power. You drive yeah, along and it just stops. One cell drops out and the whole yeah, thing stops. Yeah, the whole thing yeah. stops. So yeah. there was a recall issued. I don't know if it's been classified as a safety recall officially, but there is a recall to all 2017 bolt owners. And uh, the automaker says that they're going to perform a software update in-house that'll provide additional warnings if they think the battery could drop to like a dangerous condition where the, it could just die. So you'll get some sort of notification, you know, battery's about to die, you know, pull over or whatever. So you can take some corrective action uh, before it loses propulsion. And uh, apparently the 2018 Bolt, so if you have one of those, are not affected in this. Okay. So I'm not 100% sure, and it doesn't seem to be all of them, but they have, they are issuing this this update. Um, now, in conjunction with that, they are now starting to provide over-the-air updates, which is good to see manufacturers good. jump on I'm that bandwagon. Uh, these updates are typically going to help improve phone connectivity, your display resolutions, rear camera operations, and, and assorted bug fixes. Um, and then you'll be able to improve um, software updates on your radio as well with these. Now, we're not sure if this particular recall 
will be done over the air or you have to send, take it into a service station. It's not 100% clear. So there, there may be a mix on that. It's good to see Chevy Bolt owners going to get Christmas in July too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Christmas can happen anytime. Uh, yeah, it's like Christmas. Just look outside. <laughs> Uh, moving on, staying in the GM umbrella, though, with Buick, um, they've launched a concept that they call Inspire, and it's a pretty neat-looking car. That's, that's an awesome-looking it's, it's car. A, very nice. And I know you got a few pictures behind us. Now, remember, it is a concept, and, oh, of yeah. course, gee, it's an SUV. Hmm. We talked about that. They have market there. That's where there. the money is. That's where they're showing the money. It's estimated at 370 mile EPA range, 0 to 16, 4 seconds, 400 kilowatt of power, 410 kilowatts of power. However, don't get your hopes up because right now this is potentially a China only offering. Mm. It seems that they want to go after that huge market that we really don't talk about China because it would be a, a whole show in itself and, and a series on what's going on in China. They are just going through the roof on electrification. But this is something that uh, Buick seems pretty uh, intense on going after that market space. And uh, it's an exploration of Buick's bold design ideas and innovative technologies for future mobility. So concept. We'll see. <laughs> Stay tuned for that. It looks that. good, it does but look good. you know GM has a track record with their concepts of dumbing them down. So they just do. you know it looks great, but keep in mind it's it's going to be backed off a little bit. Mm -hmm. Encouraging. Now you mentioned Mercedes earlier that BMW is feeling the heat. Well, they continue to pour it on from an electrification standpoint by announcing the EQS sedan that they want to come out with. It's going to basically be a S class level all electric car. It's going to be their high 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 end. To me, that means high, high, high price. But anyway, it's all good. Oh, yeah. It'll be top of the line luxury based on the MEA platform. Uh, estimated production in 2020. There's that magical year. Uh, no other specs released other than some pictures, I think, from Geneva. I'm not sure. Or New York. One of the, the, the recent mm -hmm. auto shows. Um, but yeah, it'll it'll be out there. And it'll be... Uh, Looking forward to seeing that For you too. executives that want to drive in some luxurious <laughs> cars, you will have something in a few years. Now, we've talked a lot about VW and some in their cars that they're coming out with. Uh, we just wanted to mention... That there was a recent article that came out that that VW is reestablishing their commitment to electrification by building more battery packs per year. Um, the Braunschweig factory in Germany, uh, which the MEB platform is built on, uh, for the for that MEB platform builds battery packs today for plug-in electric cars. So they're going to increase the capacity there to to at least half a million packs per year, if not more. Um, and in conjunction with that, VW has also ordered up to $20 billion, and that's billion with a B. It's a big number mm -hmm. of batteries uh, to be able to facilitate the production of those packs. We're, they haven't said who their battery supplier is, and we're not sure if they're sole sourcing or multi-sourcing uh, from this. I would guess sole source, but uh, it could be either LG Chem, Samsung SDI, or the guys in Hungary at SK Innovation. So we'll have to wait and see. But yeah, so you, you think it might be Samsung. That's kind of where you're um, Well, only because they've sure. used them in the e-golf, mm -hmm. so, but, but you know, anything's up for grabs. But they are committed, seems to be, uh, they're, they're doing the pouch cell thing. So. Mm -hmm. so we'll see what news, happens like there. Uh, here's a little bit of a fluff piece that we like to uh, throw up for when we see new manufacturers, and we've put a few of these oddball ones uh, up on the show before, but this is a Czech Republic manufacturer, uh, and they've launched a, uh, an EV called the Luca EV, and when you look at the, some of these pictures you're seeing behind us, it really kind of a cross between a Carmen Ghia, the, the AM Austin Martin DB4, and kind of an older Mercedes-Benz 190 SL from different angles. Um, it's got four 12 and a half kilowatt motors uh, pumping out s almost 17 horsepower each. These are in wheel motors. Uh, so they, they combine to create a total of about 50 kilowatts, uh, just under 70 horsepower. Doesn't sound like a, a lot, but this car is fairly light. There's a lot of carbon fiber in it, if I remember reading some of the specs. Mm. So it provides a zero to 60 in under 10 second little ja jaunt. And uh, it does have some aluminum chassis components as well with a uh, just under 22 kilowatt hour battery pack with an estimated range of about 300 kilometers or 186 miles. Uh, they didn't say if this is EPA, NEDC, or that WPTL, just, those, or whatever the other one is. NEDC so. numbers it to does. <laughs> <laughs> it does. But uh, hey, you know, no pricing or delivery. But I could see this as a little Sunday, you know, in the summer. It's retro. I like it. Going to a car show or whatever, and throwing, you know, and or Bond, James Bond, but whatever. Right? Yeah, I like it. Page, it's... Trevor Page <laughs> has a nice ring to it. Oh my gosh, <laughs> with a martini, but no alcohol. <laughs> but stay tuned if the if we see yeah. that this goes What's out of country. What's the company called? MW Motors. Um, MW Motors. Yes, the that's Czech the Republic. company. So yeah, check it out. Check it out in the Czech. Exactly. If you're there, let us know. 
Uh, now, uh, you had heard a story in Belgium about a new supercharger that uh, that opened up from a Tesla perspective. Do you want to talk about that? It's in Belgium's, it's a, their 11th supercharger at the Novotel yeah, in Antwerp. We're pretty Mark. good friends yeah. with the guys in Belgium. Uh, Martin sent me a bunch of pictures that he took. I'll put them up behind, uh, behind us. And they made a big shinding. And, of course, uh, the star of the show, of course, was uh, Yo-Yo showed up with his Model 3. Yo-Yo showed up, yeah. Uh, yeah uh-huh. uh, I must have just missed people. them because I was just in, in that area yeah, like so, two weeks ago. Yeah, so. so he showed up with his Model 3. It was a big hit. Yeah. Uh, big shout-out to Michael Russo, too, who yeah. just took delivery of his yes. uh, his CPO Model S, and he was supercharging I was the first there. guy to see it. We had dinner that yeah. night. He got it. Yeah, so, so a good shout-out hey, to Mike. Michael and stuff. So he had a chance to sit in the Model 3, so yeah. he was all very happy about that. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, we'd like to be able to report more on supercharger openings in future shows, so we'll make a point of mm-hmm. doing that. It, it's growing like crazy, so mm-hmm. I don't know how fast we'll be able to keep up on it. Yeah. But uh, it's very encouraging that the supercharger networks continue to grow. Now, we talked about some of the March numbers, and there was a report that came out about the top six automakers in the USA that are closest to hitting that 200,000 sales for the, reaching the phase out of the U.S. tax credit. Uh, good thing is it's still alive because right? there was some controversy mm-hmm. last year. Yeah. So out of those top six manufacturers, this is as of the end of March, if I believe my numbers are correct. Uh, BMW had just under 64,000 units sold uh, in the U.S., Toyota at 75,000 ish, Ford at 106,000, uh, Nissan number three at 117,000, and of course they are starting to sell a lot more. GM with a combined 176,000, and that's including Cadillac and Chevrolet divisions. And of course the number one uh, EV seller of the US is Tesla with 177,000 and change. Not a, and then that's excluding the Roadster, but the Roadster wasn't much anyway. What? 2500 or something yeah it was very limited so let's say closer to 180,000 now we were talking about this off show but we do expect that tesla and there's a lot of reports whether they're purposely holding back you know u.s deliveries or not who knows but we just by the way things are trending with the shutdown that we expect that they'll hit the 200,000 mark in july that's kind of a safe bet I doubt it'll be before that. It's important to remember, too, and we want to reiterate that the federal tax credit does not immediately get cut off the moment they sell the 200,000th car. It triggers a phase-out period. Mm -hmm. So for the first, uh, what is it, six months? Six months, yeah. So the first six months that they hit the calendar quarter at 200,000, you still qualify for the full $7,500 credit. So if Mm -hmm. you're counting on the credit to be able to afford the Model 3, uh, you're still safe at least until they hit that. And then for another six months, they're still okay. After yeah. the six months, then they have another six months. Or was it one more calendar quarter? I forget what it is. Mm-hmm. But anyways, that rebate now gets cut uh, by 50%. So then it's 37.50. Mm-hmm. And then after that, it gets cut yet again. And then after that, it's just it's just gone. So Correct. Yeah. So if they hit it in July, you'll get 100% till December. And then it'll go to 50% in January of next year until end of June. And then 25% end of, from June uh, f- only for a single quarter after that. So it, it, if it makes that sense, it'll end in September of 2019 at yeah. that pace. So there's still lots of room to collect something uh, based on that. So if we hear anything more, and GM, if you're looking at the bolts, if you can find one, uh, they seem to be starting to close. Uh, they may even hit that mark this this calendar year too. They could, they could if they keep production up. I mean, I I mean get worldwide production is only about 25,000 cars a year. Yeah. So how much go in the U.S. as opposed to abroad? Yeah. Know, how many so. Cadillacs are they? I don't even know how many. Not many because they only plugins. really did the ELR and right. it's a dead product anyways because yeah. it's just too bloody expensive. Exactly. And one last thing, we just kind of wanted to re- to talk about one of there's many reasons why Trevor and I do what we do. I mean, we have full time jobs. We're pretty busy, so this is more of a passion and a hobby for <laughs> us, that's for sure. But you know, we, we are very concerned about climate change and global warming and and all that kind of stuff, lowering greenhouse gas emissions. And there's a study that just came out uh, by the Center uh, for Polar Observation and Modeling. Uh, I believe it's a UK study from the University of Leeds, and basically they mapped. They did a complete underwater mapping of the Arctic. Greenland and Antarctic ice shelves and they've come to the conclusion that uh, all these ice shelves are being melted away at the base so you're not seeing them from an aerial perspective like the iceberg thing. they did an underwater uh, type of mapping scenario but because uh, yes because most of the ice is submerged you don't see that uh, they are mel- they are melting away at an alarming rate and um, because the the water underneath those uh, ice shelves are warmer than it used to be and uh, so it's con- obviously this is going to contribute to global uh, sea level rise. Scientists say that if all the ice at both poles melts, again, that would be a long time for that to happen, but that ocean levels would rise by 216 feet. And that would be a pretty game changer from, oh my a, gosh. from a planet perspective. So 
uh, you know, if people that uh, people that are saying that the increase in greenhouse gas emissions is not contributing to climate change, well, I, I think that we beg to differ on that. And there's definitely lots of facts to support that, uh, that they believe, are contributing. You know what? Whether you believe in climate change or not doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. The fact that we humans, with industrialization and burning of everything, we're not helping things. We're definitely not we helping. We are not helping. And if you look, there's several graphs out there that show... You know, the increase in the worldwide temperature is almost mm -hmm. following exactly the rise in industrialization since the yeah. 1800s. Yeah, so I, mean, I think there's some kind of correlation there. Absolutely. But the bottom line is that we're polluting the planet. It's not It's mm -hmm. not good for anybody, yeah. including all the animals we have to share the planet yeah. with. So I do a lot cool. of traveling and everywhere I go overseas, everybody's weather is, is different. It's it's completely oh, different. There's yeah. no patterns anymore. It's just completely different. Uh, well, you know, where it should be warm, it's cold. Where it should be cold, it's warm. It's, it's all over the place. So Crazy. things are happening. Yeah. Let's get in the mailbag. Oh, we love mailbag. We what do, do we love mailbag. Now, we just have one mail uh, that came in uh, recently. Uh, this is from uh, Pieter. Uh, it's not Peter. I think it's Pieter. And he's in South Africa. Well, thank you very much for tuning in all oh, the way yes. halfway around the world. We appreciate that. Um, and he's asking, uh, he, he heard that Tesla is going to set up a battery factory there. And is, is there any truth in it? Because BMW and Nissan are selling EVs there. Uh, they have already about 60 charging points set up in the Johannesburg area. Uh, that's at least a start. Um, he loves the show and he just wanted to know if we had any kind of uh, thoughts to when Tesla might set up something there. Well, that's a really good question. Thanks for sending that in. Yeah. Well, um, I follow Tesla very closely and they have not made any formal announcements as far as next battery. So, and South Africa is not something I've heard. I mean, there's potentials for all over the world. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, there's there's nothing that I'm aware of that that's happening. So Teslas are sold and delivered in South Africa, though, right? There, I believe you oh, can get them. I, I don't know. I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm I'm go I'm going to say no, but I could be wrong on mm -hmm. that. And don't if know. I am wrong, of course, we'll, let us we'll, we'll let people will let us be know in the, in the comments. comments. Yes, I'm, I'm <laughs> we sorry. We love the comments. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I mean, of course, Elon has ties to South Africa. So that's where mm -hmm. he was born. So yes. he would stand the reason that they would set up shop there. And, and there's no reason not to think that they won't set up shop there eventually. It's just right now they mm -hmm. have to go where the money is. And, yeah. and, and that's you know, and that, that and market in Africa is not as big as some of the other potential markets like China and others that they really want well, to get into. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So, oh, by the way, we want to make a yeah. mention, too. Mm -hmm. um, if you'd like to send in something for mailbag, uh, feel free to send it in as, as an audio recording. Yeah. You can record something on your phone or your or your computer, or whatever, and you can just email it to us. Uh, try to keep it under a minute so that we're not, you know, <laughs> listening to it for, for three minutes at a time. And, uh, yeah, and we'll certainly air it on the show and answer it that way. So it's not strictly email anymore. You can certainly do it that way. So how can people reach us? Well, and they, and they can also video, by the way, if you're not afraid to get your face on camera like we oh, are. Sure, we'll then, uh, we're not, then we'll take the video as well. But, again, keep it under a minute. So send us that e email to evrevolutionshow at gmail.com. That's our new uh, email for this show, evrevolutionshow at gmail.com. You can, of course, follow us on Twitter at the new Twitter handle at, at evrevshow. Of course, you still have your Twitter going. Yeah, I do. And don't forget, you can check out the uh, Model 3 Owners Club website for all things Model 3. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And don't forget to click the little bell icon so you get instant notification as soon as a video goes out, including this show. Mm -hmm. And uh, lastly, we want to mention our Patreon campaign, of course. Uh, all the Patreon supporters make this show happen. It pays for equipment and time, travel, and so on and so forth. So we really appreciate everybody on there. Uh, so you can check that out at uh, patreon.com forward slash Model 3 Owners Club. Haven't changed the name yet. We're just kind of right. leaving it there for now yeah, because you know, it really goes into this show for Yeah. Now, this so. show will still continue to be delivered both on the Model 3 Owners Club channel and the newer um, EV Revolution show YouTube channel that we set up. If you are subscribed to the Model 3 Owners Club channel, we would love it if you could subscribe to the EV Revolution show channel as well so we can start getting those numbers up. As we talked about you know, earlier in some of the shows, it just really helps to kind of give us credibility uh, when we're out there. Our plans are to do a lot more coverage from a vehicle perspective. We are trying to get into all the other manufacturers out there that have plans for electrification so we can start doing reviews of cars and getting into press sessions and this kind of stuff when things come and out. Now that the know. weather's warming yeah. up, of course, we're doing a lot more community outreaches and mm -hmm. stuff. So if you're out there in the southern Ontario region, you'll see our faces. You'll see us <laughs> and come and say hi, as people do, which is great. So again, that's, uh, well, there's another show in the can. So sounds good. did a good Anyways, job. Yeah, sounds good. So uh, thanks for watching, uh, folks, and we'll see you on the next one. Yep. Take care. Bye-bye. See ya.